It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My next guest is Stuart Murdoch of the band Bell and Sebastian. In the pantheon of rock band meat cutes, Bell and Sebastian's is probably one of the weirdest. Stuart, who founded the band, never really had any interest in playing music. I mean, he took piano lessons, he played in recitals, but in college, when his friends were playing in bands, he was happy to watch from the crowd. Maybe DJ sometimes. Around the beginning of the 90s, though, that changed. Murdoch started to feel exhausted and sore pretty much all of the time. He couldn't concentrate. Sleep would come, but it wouldn't help. He'd come down with chronic fatigue syndrome, also known as myalgic encephalomyelitis, or ME. Murdoch dropped out of school, stopped running track, stopped DJing, moved back in with his parents. And at home, he started writing songs on the piano. On the advice of his doctor, he took a class for unemployed musicians. There he met Stuart David. The music they made together eventually became Bell and Sebastian. Got married in a rush to save a kid from being deported. Now she's in love. Oh, oh, oh I was so touched. I was moved to kick the crutches from my crippled friend. Since their debut, Bell and Sebastian Records have made it on literally hundreds of top 10 lists. Their second album, 1996's If You're Feeling Sinister, is routinely called one of the best albums of the 90s. These days, Murdoch still fronts the band. He's got a wife and kids. And through all that, he still deals with his chronic fatigue. In the last couple of months, the band has released a handful of EPs. They're called How to Solve Our Human Problems. The third and final EP of the trilogy is coming out next week. Let's take a listen to the first track from it. It's called Poor Boy. Murdoch, welcome to Bullseye. It's great to have you on the show. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks, Jesse. That's like a that's like a chic song there. Wow, that's uh, that's a compliment. Huge. I have you ever met Nile Rodgers before? I've been very yes. I I uh, the, a festival last year in Spain or France or somewhere like that or in, in fact Scandinavia, and uh, I watched his set and then just saw him come into the hotel afterwards and I. I said, great set, and I shook his hand. <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> That's my Nile moment. Maybe like four or five years ago, he had a memoir that came out, and he came on the show. And it was just at the time I recorded the show at my house, and he just came over to my house. And he, he may be the most charming and magnetic human being I've ever met in my entire life. Like, he's just radiant with pleasantness, I guess, would be the word I would choose. Absolutely, one of those one of those personalities. And uh, actually, my wife, you know, she was a radio presenter for a while. Uh, sorry, worked on radio, and and she um, interviewed. And so I uh, a few years ago, and I and I went just to just to listen to the stories. He's he's got all the great stories, doesn't he? Yeah, God, does he ever? There's a bit more dance music on your more recent records. Was that a choice that you made? Do you know what? 
it's not so much a. I guess it is a choice. It's it's, it's maybe it's just the cells in our body. It's our bodies making that choice. Um, you know, maybe maybe it's the kind of the dads in us. You know, we're getting to that stage where we're kind of older now. We just want to dance. We don't, <laughs> you know, we don't care. We don't care what we look like. We don't care what we sound like. We just we just want to before the joints go completely. Um, we just want to move a little bit. I like the idea that you've recommitted yourself to making music for uncles at weddings. <laughs> um, which is not a bad thing. You know, I go to whenever I'm at a wedding. There's always some absolutely stone cold classic that you haven't heard for a while that the the DJ will play so yeah I like wedding music you were uh you were before you got ill the sort of process that led to Bell and Sebastian you were like DJing and working at a record store and when you were doing those things the official cool things of guys that love music and ladies that love music uh you weren't thinking like, hmm, maybe I should start one of these bands. It's weird. It never, it never, never occurred to me. I never had it in me, and I was just so in love with other people's music. And I, I mean, I tell you what, my taste was always, my, you know, my taste, my radar, and everything was always fully on. I, I would sit night after night, you know, because I roadied a lot as well, and 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 helped other bands out. And I would sit on the stage night after night when great bands, um, you know, came through town. Even when I'd never heard the band, I would know straight away you've got something. You, you know, you're going to make it. You're terrific. Or oh no, these are record company stooges, or these, you know, somebody's throwing a lot of money at you guys, and you guys are never going to make it. So I, I definitely formed my opinions at that time. When and how did you end up getting uh, or, or starting to suffer from the symptoms of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome? That was about just the end of the 80s. It was um, it's funny the way the decade thing works. You know, I had a great 80s. That's my <laughs> class. <laughs> That's my cla- I'll defend the 80s to anyone, you know. I, it's a classic uh, decade for me. For, uh, uh, but, you know, by the end, uh, the, the last thing that happened is that Acid House uh, happened in Britain. And, um, you know, so I, I, I got into that and, you know, it's, that affected my DJing and all that. And it was a great time to be a DJ. But just at the same time, though, I, my symptoms of ME started. And so I kind of burned out on a lot of things. And by the end of 1990 I really my energy had gone and and I'd given up all um you know I was still I, I was still at college at that time and I gave up the college and I gave up my work and I gave up my athletics and you know ended up back at my parents house how did the symptoms manifest themselves at first just a just a almost like a, a car running out of gas um you know, or a toy running out of batteries. It was simple as that. And it might sound maybe not too insidious, but it takes a toll out of you mentally. It's a, it's a weird thing to just, you know, this is happening to me. My, my body is, is, something's gone wrong and my, my body's just running down and I can't do any of the things that I used to do. And I'm, I can't keep up with my friends and, um, you know, and the doctor's, can't tell me what's going on and it, it it definitely messes with your head i um also have a a chronic health condition that is like poorly understood i have very frequent and severe migraine headaches and the thing that i remember when i started getting headaches as um basically around puberty for me is that It was very lonely because it did not manifest itself outwardly. Um, Unless I was in tears from pain, uh, no one saw that I was in pain. And so a a lot of people in my life either, you know, I don't want to say didn't believe me, but kind of didn't believe me. And also... Even those who did, it was like an impossible task to explain what it was that I was experiencing. And I wonder if you had that experience when you were kind of rolling back your life to accommodate the situation you were in, that 
part of the difficulty of it is that, you know, it's even a doctor doesn't really understand what it is. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear about your headaches uh, and the way that you described um, people not understanding or it's exactly, you know, that's exactly what happens with ME, with, with chronic fatigue. And why would they? It's so difficult. Um, you know, people have so much going on in their life. Why would they notice there's that going on with you? And it, it does go on. It goes on to the, the present day. I've had this thing 28, 29 years. I mean, for the first, you know, when I knew the band at first, when I started to know the band, I never told them anything because we, as, an, as a community of ME, chronic fatigue people, learned not to talk about it. Um, we just didn't have the energy to explain. <laughs> and, and what was the point anyway? Because it would take somebody with great empathy, somebody who'd been in a similar situation. I mean, I understand with your headaches, you know, to understand. And so it's, yeah, it's, uh, that's a, a whole dimension to the thing. Was part of what was difficult and scary about it that it was so difficult to put a finger on that it barely had a name and a set of symptoms in a, you know, a book of diseases and medical conditions. And like, besides that, it was sort of like, uh, will it come? Will it go? Is it, you know? I'm a, I'm a, I mean, I'm almost like afraid to report, but to, to this day, that's, I, I do live in fear and I, I fight that fear every day because it's, you know, it comes in the morning, it comes during practice. I could be at practice and I'll be in pain all day. And the psychological, you know, you're just bruised by the end of the day and maybe you're in tears because you don't want to give up your job. Um, but at the same time, it's so unpleasant to be suffering um, sort of through the day. And of course, there doesn't seem to be any parameters with these things. You are a voice crying in your own uh, wilderness um, there's no particular you can't go to an emergency pill to get you through something um, so you know anything that you can use you know Buddhism Christianity I'll <laughs> I'll, t I'll, be, I'll take them all <laughs> my father when I was a kid worked in the independent living movement movement with disabled people and his best friend was paralyzed by polio below the neck. So he, he could move one finger and below the neck and had to use a breathing machine all the time and had a big motorized wheelchair. And his, his name was Ed Roberts. And one of the things that Ed used to talk about was, you know, you have this disability, right? You are living with this disability that is makes your life very different from the people around you. But in a lot of ways, it can be, you know, it can be a power or make you develop a power in a way. And it seems to me like if you had not had this health condition, all of these amazing things that happened in your life might never have taken place. That The fact that you spent years in your early 20s suffering from this condition, living at home, in a way seems like it was the thing that slowed down your life to the point where you focused on this one thing that you might never otherwise have spent years focusing on and it and it might have been the thing that that led to you becoming a songwriter yes uh, i i absolutely uh, agree with you it was the it was the moment that turned uh, my life upside down uh, in 1990 and um and so much happened it was it was year zero everything my old personality and the, the practical life that i had before was left behind and it was a blank slate. And I actually, I spent uh, quite a lot of time in hospital around that time. I was so debilitated. And when I started to pick up, because it, you know, it did me some good being in the hospital. And finally, when I made it out, I made it back to my parents' house. I knew that I wasn't going to get any worse. I knew that this was the start of looking ahead and that I was mentally positive, uh, even though I had lost you know, 50 or 60% of my energy at that point. But um, strange things happened. And that was, you know, in that quietness, back in my folks' house, 
I, I, you know, I started to go to the piano and I started to invent tunes. And I also realized that, that I could speak a narrative and that I could turn my thoughts into words and that I could quite easily turn them into tunes. So it was, it, it, it seems like, um, like an obvious thing, you know, for some songwriters to do. It wasn't for me. It, it took step by step. Uh, I suddenly realized I could communicate in this way. And um, in, in the quietness, I realized I had quite a lot to say that I would never have thought of saying before. Your new record is uh, an EP, one of three that you've put out recently. You also put out EPs in the mid-1990s. And I want to play a song called Dog on Wheels from 1995. confounded by you and still a boy I am indebted to you every song I ever wrote was written for you written for you now I'm feeling flat you seem a mile away I'm so tired that down on the pavement I'll lay Till the blossom of the tree comes falling on me, fall on me. You know, your music is usually described as um, indie pop, uh, which I think is a word for things that are song-driven and melodic, but aren't folk music and aren't uh, super hard rockin'. I, I know that you loved, like, and love, like, just straight up, bubblegum pop music from the 60s, the Archies or whatever. And I wonder if you ever aspired to be a hit songwriter. <laughs> that's a good question. I think in a different time, in a different place, but that's that's the case for so many, so many people that, you know, they're wishing they were in, in another time. Uh, it's it's fantastic to, to think about, you know, what happened in the, the 60s and then, but also the you know the eighties was a great time for pop, especially in Britain. And yeah, we 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 sort of play this game in the group that we we kind of wish somebody would commission us to write pop music for somebody else. And 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 we actually go out and we try to write songs for other people. We for interesting singers and but um, I guess it, you know there's so many musicians and bands and people around these days. It's it's a hard gig to get. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you think of a great single pop song, like, I mean, the one that comes to my mind is I Want You Back, right? But we could talk about a, a chic song, right? We could talk about uh, Freak Out, or as, or as it was originally titled, <laughs> Off. Yeah. Um, those songs are songs that have a very particular emotional idea, like, <laughs> Off. And the lyrics are mostly expressing that one idea. There's not a usually a ton of specificity in them. They're not often character-driven. I mean, there are certainly specific smash hit great pop songs, but mostly it's like, you know, You Send Me is just Sam Cooke saying You Send Me over and over. <laughs> that's that's a, one of my favorites. That's a beautiful song. Oh, my God, is it ever. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful songs ever written. And uh, your songs are all about detail. Like, detail is in every single one of them. And I, I wonder if you ever thought, like, you know what? We're going to write 12 songs, and they're gonna, one's going to be called Dance, Dance, Dance. <laughs> one's going to be called The Power of Love. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I think at one time in Britain, there was, there was three songs called The Power of Love all in the charts at the, the same time. <laughs> There was the Hu Huey Lewis. There was Frankie goes to Hollywood, and, and then Jennifer Rush. You know? Um, you know, so so you could be, yeah, you could be right. We, we have, I, I have a friend who, who who sometimes when I see him in the street, just comes up to me and says, you know, play your music in the sunshine. That's that should be the the, the name of your next. <laughs> and, and and all it all it goes. This is how it goes. Play your music in the sunshine. Everybody feels fine. That's it. <laughs> That's the chorus. Your trouble is you never write any choruses. <laughs>
I, I want to play another Bell and Sebastian song. This is from uh, the 2003 album, Dear Catastrophe Waitress. It's called Piazza, New York Catcher. Um, but, but before we actually hit play on the song, it does seem to be tangentially about a Hall of Fame baseball catcher, Mike Piazza, formerly of the New York Mets. How did you come to write a song <laughs> where that was a reference point? Do you know, I think tangential is the word and, and it's just one of these it's just one of these nice situations where you've got you've got a bundle of experiences backed up in your the back of your brain somewhere and they all tumble out at once and and there's there's different strands and there was there was the relationship with, with Marissa who was then who was to become my wife and there was our peripatetic existence, the way that we met in in you know, in European or American cities. There was also our, our kind of bonding over baseball in the New York Mets, and um, so the, these strands all tied together and and just hit the page. Let's take a listen. I don't put me my private, and we'll sail around the world. I will be off at an end, and you, my wayward girl. The many nights of talking in the hotel rooms, can you take? The many nights of limping round and pagan holidays. With me in private And we'll set something ablaze A trail for the devil to erase San Francisco's calling us The Giants and Mets will play Piazza New York Catcher, are you straight or are you gay? We hung about the stadium We got no place to stay We hung about the tenderloin And tenderly you tell about The saddest book you ever read it always makes you cry. The statue's crying too, and Willie May. So, are you a Mets fan? Yeah, I, I, I do. I do like the Mets ever since um, my friend Nate first took me to a game at Shea back in the late '90s or early 2000s. Yeah. I feel like had I not grown up with baseball, I can hardly imagine the amount of work it would take to follow baseball. <laughs> it's such a weird sport and very boring. Like, I love baseball, but anytime anyone is criticizing baseball, they're like, it's boring. It's weird. What are they doing? Like, why does the one guy have to hit the ball? All that stuff. Like, why are there long breaks? I, I am just like, yes, you are correct on all fronts. If basketball is definitely more fun. Football is amazing and so complicated and uh, takes so much brains. Soccer is so universal, and you could all you need is a, a ball and uh, a ball and some garbage cans. Uh, and yes, all of those are true. I have no idea why I like baseball so much. So the idea of picking up baseball as a non-American is just baffling to me. Well, we have we have this game cricket, which is it's it's possibly even less understandable. <laughs> That's true uh, because you know, I understand baseball and I have tried to understand cricket. And my friend Andy Zaltzman is like the world's foremost cricket comedian, <laughs> and like I have no idea. I laughed. I there's a you know that movie, the Fantastic Mr. Fox, the way the Wes Anderson one, the cartoon, the animation. Yeah, it's a great one. Um, he, he has a he, so he kind of made up this game called Whack Bat, I think it's called, and I think he's riffing on his experience of trying to understand what cricket is because it's a very uh, you know it's a it's based in Britain the whole the whole film the whole Fantastic Mr. Fox, and uh, so it's funny the way that he sort of sends that up. But um, you know, but uh, you know, baseball, I guess, started with the English game of rounders, and then when you guys took it on, uh, you made up your own rules and you refined it and made it a faster game. I think there is also another essential appeal of baseball that I've heard from folks who are casual, very casual baseball fans. Folks who go to a ball game, uh, but don't necessarily follow a team or whatever, and that is. It is kind of nice to sit there, and if you drink beer, have a beer and a hot dog, and it's kind of pretty, and it doesn't ask that much of you. I think that's exactly it. I, I, no matter which American city we're in, I just it's one of these 
things that I do, you know, I like to walk across American cities. I like to run across them when I, well, when I used to have energy. You know, I like to go to church in American cities. I like to meditate in American cities. And I like to watch baseball. And to me, they, they all, all these things that I've described, they have an essence of, of the meditative about them. They also is an opportunity to see uh, America just relaxing, just, you know, rather than being a tourist, you actually belong in a game and you, be, you know, whereas you belong in church as well. How big of a part of your life is meditation? Um, well, it's become a thing. Yeah. And, you know, I, I like, I was just talking to my wife on the, the phone before and, and I, we were just remarking that when trouble happens or when a problem happens in your life, you know, maybe a bigger thing, then quite often there's a, there's a counterpoint to it if you just go looking for it. Um, you know, which is sweet. And, and then the overall effect is that you, through the whole process, you sometimes come out being a better person and with a little bit more wisdom. And I think the counterpoint to me, having the kind of relapse in a difficult time the last three or four years was stumbling back into the kind of the meditation center and, and sitting through so many sort of Buddhist classes. Um, so that's, it's definitely become a, a thing and it's seeped into the music too. How has it seeped into the music? Well, you know, even the, the fact that we've called this series of records How to Solve Our Human Problems, that's one of the books that we study. That's one of the books that we read from uh, in the particular uh, centre that I go to. I, they're, they're always reading from that book. And I, at just one point I realised, well, that's what we have to call the the record. I'm going to pinch that title. And, and I asked... I asked the, the, the writer of the book, Geshe Kelsang, if, if that would be okay, and, and he thought it was a good thing. Stuart Murdoch, thank you so much for joining me on Bullseye. It was really great to get to talk to you. Thank you, Jesse. It was great to talk to you. Let's listen to one last song from Bell and Sebastian's uh, new EPs that have come out over the last year. This is from part two. It's called I'll Be Your Pilot. Got your dreams completely I've got them locked away and That doesn't mean I own you Or control the head of your sweet head I won't leave you to suffer Stuart Murdoch, their newest record, How to Solve Our Human Problems, Part 3, is out now. Buy it, stream it, I guess ask your smart speaker to play it. I think that would probably work. Whatever you do to listen to music these days, Bell and Sebastian, How to Solve Our Human Problems. Lying here in the sweet Sahara, thousand miles to the nearest problem. I see you sleep. 